Final Fantasy VII Rebirth has been a tremendous success in bringing open world to the series. A mission first started by Final Fantasy XV sees its next evolution with Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, a world that is filled with things to do and many games to play, all being made with a four-year development cycle. If you've seen my review for the game, I call it arguably the best Final Fantasy game ever made, because the sheer volume of content and the quality of that content shoots past not only recent recent Final Fantasy games, but even the golden era Final Fantasy games didn't have this much content, and this is just a third of the new re-trilogy. It is absolutely mind-boggling what they were able to accomplish. Today they talk not only about how they were able to accomplish this, they also talk about an incredible feature coming in Final Fantasy VII Remake Part 3. This was a feature that before Rebirth I assumed was not possible. Then I saw something in Rebirth, and I was like, oh my god, they've actually laid out the technology and I think they're going to be able to do it. It is something that I have been wanting Final Fantasy to return to for a very long time, and it's something I figured was impossible due to the technology, but we got some confirmation that it is coming back in a very big way, and I could not be more excited. So please go ahead and hit that subscribe button, as this is your complete hub for Final Fantasy news. In a recent interview done by Gene Park for the Washington Post, Gene was able to sit down with Final Fantasy VII Rebirth producer Yoshinori Kitase, and he shared some incredibly enlightening news with us. Kitase claims that developing for a single platform actually sped up development quite tremendously. The article saying, quote, its development exclusively for the PlayStation 5 made it easier for the team to focus on building a world with diverse geography, indoor and outdoor areas populated with activities, characters friendly and hostile, all seamlessly represented with no load screen interruptions. Developing for multi-platforms, by contrast, usually creates more work that focuses on porting rather than iterating on game design. Kitase then saying, quote, Had it not been on a single platform, the world map would not be seamless, and game design may have had to regress significantly. Now, for a lot of people, they read this as console wars nonsense, and they interpret this statement as, oh, he's talking about the power of the PS5, a lot like how Yoshi P did during the promotion of Final Fantasy 16. However, that's not actually what he's saying here. In fact, he's not even really saying anything specific about PS5. He's just telling you the reality for any developer out there, and I'm not even just talking about game developers. If you're a software developer that's had to work with more than one operating system, if you're a web developer and you've ever opened your website on two different browsers and found that a page that you wrote was rendering different in Chrome than it was Safari, then you know exactly what Kitase is talking about. And this is why he says that, hey, instead of taking developers away to focus focus on porting things, if say the Xbox or the PC version is running behind, which is something that does happen even when you're using a multi-platform engine like Unreal, it allowed them to focus purely on just making the content. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not the biggest fan of third-party exclusives, and I don't think that every game should be made like this, but I am saying that I completely get why it was like this for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and it is something that makes development that much easier. Another thing that kept development speed on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth was the employee retention. The article saying that, quote, more than 80% of the development team from Remake stayed on for the sequel. Remake built digital assets that would be reused for the sequel, and the team was able to bypass laborious and time-wasting tasks such as retraining staff on tools. This is also a huge benefit of using Unreal Engine 4. It's an engine that many people in the industry have experience with. Whenever you're building custom engines, anyone that you hire to work on the project is going to have to be trained. Of course, it's not just being trained on the engine itself. You also build your own custom tools to be used for the game. So even if you are using something widespread like Unreal Engine 4, you still have to train new employees on how to use your own proprietary stuff. The combination of the two led to Final Fantasy VII Rebirth being one of the most content-dense RPGs of the generation. Keeping employees and teams together is also something the industry should be paying attention to. Hamaguchi also kept the team on a very tight schedule, with Kitase saying, quote, Hamaguchi would set goals early on and made sure they were shared and understood by the entire team. Further, these goals would be broken down to midterm goals that we needed to achieve every three months, and we would host a webinar for a show and tell where teams would update one another and we could all stay on top of everything. Hamaguchi goes on to say that he's hard at work for the game design document for part three, and that much of that work is already done thanks to the world construction done in Rebirth. 
they've pretty much mapped out an entire seamless world. Something that I imagine is a lot easier to do when you're writing off the expenses of that world for two AAA games instead of just one. But mapping out the entire world is what makes the most exciting thing about the third game possible. It means that flying over the world map is now possible, and that's exactly what they aim to do. Hamaguchi says that the high wind was an important feature for him in the original game, and he wants to introduce it in Final Fantasy VII Re whatever they call it. Hamaguchi saying, quote, I definitely want to address the same for what is likely expected from our experience with the high wind to explore the world. Now for a long time, this feature seemed very unlikely to return to me. The reason that I thought the high wind would be unlikely to return is because in order to make an airship work, you have to do what Final Fantasy XV did essentially and build out the entire world map. This would then be something that players were able to dynamically fly across and be able to go from ground to air in a split second without any load screens. Of course, that's a really expensive task, because if your game is an open world and doesn't have a seamlessly connected map, then there really isn't a point of making an airship. Sure, you can make a small map that users can fly around, but it wouldn't be that much different than having a level select screen. Amaguchi had the foresight, diligence, and intelligence to go ahead and begin building the map out physically, making sure that it was all seamlessly connected. Originally, we thought these games would use large zones. This, of course, would not make flight possible, and it's why flying airships has gone away in the modern era of Final Fantasy. On top of which, there is a modern expectation of games to have fast travel. So when you combine the fact that making a seamless world map is incredibly expensive, with the fact that users are probably just going to fast travel everywhere anyway instead of actually flying across the world map, it begins to make more sense to just allow the users to fast travel rather than fly around the world. However, I don't think anything has ever replaced the sense of freedom as well as the scope and scale that the world map gives. It's one of the core iconic features of Final Fantasy, and I think you can take any upcoming Final Fantasy game and tell people that airships will be in it, and they will go completely bonkers. It's something that I think, if possible, FF should stop compromising on. The airship should remain a unique iconography in Final Fantasy, and not just in a cutscene. It should be something core and essential to the gameplay. Of course, in order to do that, that means that in future games, they will have to build out the world map and continue to make games in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth's fashion. But if I'm honest, that's exactly what I think they should do. And this is always controversial because people think that you want Final Fantasy to necessarily stay the same, but that's not what I'm pushing for. And whenever you look back at Final Fantasy 1 through 9 in particular, they weren't always just some random thing. They were built off of a formula in place, a style of combat that was mixed up in many ways, such as taking the turn-based systems of 1 through 3, and adding the ATB meter to those battles in 4. The titles would feature the world map, airships, summons, and other systems that we've come to expect from Final Fantasy. But the biggest thing that I believe that they need to do is come up with a new system where they can continue to innovate and do brand new things, just like they used to in the past, while also having a stable framework that allows them to incorporate all of the features that people expect from a Final Fantasy game, such as different playable party members, the air Airship, plenty of exploration, and various mini games and gameplay diversity. Those are all loose concepts that can take the form of anything, and is also to me why Final Fantasy represents limitless potential. But with that limitless potential, you also need to have an identity. That's something that Final Fantasy once had before in a really strong way. And with Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, I can literally see the rebirth of that identity. One other thing I want to mention is the plate collapse in the Final Fantasy VII Remake part one, and how jarring the first appearance of Kate Sith is in that game. During one of the most dramatic and serious moments, you see this cartoon cat. Something that I imagine can only be tonally jarring for people who've never played FF7 before. This is something that admittedly I've criticized quite a lot. I did not think it was a good call. They've shed a little bit of light on that scene, and the answer is kind of funny to me. The article says, quote, Hamaguchi's North American staff told him that their audiences were 
nonplussed to by the scene. He said, It's really funny because in Japan, we didn't get so much of that confusion. More like, Oh, what is that a cat? It's fun, Hamaguchi said. We placed him briefly to imply in Link that he's a significant character for later. I didn't quite predict that first time players would wonder who the heck that cat is. So, if I recall correctly, according to the Ultimania, like 50,000 people died in the Sector 7 play collapse. The cartoon cat is fun. Kate Sith is really good in Rebirth, actually. But you know, while all those people are supposed to be being crushed to death, I think maybe putting the cartoon cat there was a little bit jarring. I don't think that's unfair to say. I think that 99% of the time, both Final Fantasy VII Original and Final Fantasy VII Retrilogy are great at balancing their serious moments with levity. And that is definitely one scene that in hindsight, I think they could have done a little bit better on the balance. This being said, let me know in the comments below if you are excited for the return of the high wind and airships in general. And I'll see you all in the next video.